Buddha talks about two kinds of stress or suffering in two main contexts. There's the stress or suffering, and the fact that all things are that are fabricated are in constant. The fact that they're in constancy means that as you focus on them, try to find happiness among them, it's really hard. There's stress simply in the fact of the fabrication. It's like trying to build your house on a sandy plot where the ocean is coming in and there are lots of earthquakes. Things are constantly changing. It's very unstable. If you try to place your happiness there, you suffer. But that's a different kind of suffering. That's the suffering of the Four Noble Truths, the suffering that comes from craving. And the Buddha focuses his attention there because you can do something about that. And when you do something about that, then you don't have to suffer from the other kind of stress. After all, our hunts live in the same world we do. Their experience of the six senses is fabricated. So there will be that stress, but the minds don't suffer. It's because they don't have any craving. What this means in practical terms is the world can be pretty bad. The people in the world can say all kinds of things, do all kinds of things. Thoughtful, thoughtless, kind, unkind, well-meaning, ill-meaning. And it can be painful. So the Buddha is not denying that there are bad things out there, but he's saying that the suffering that really weighs down your mind and the suffering that really matters is the suffering that you add on top of these things. This is why we sit and meditate and close our eyes, so we can see what the mind is doing right now, and it's adding unnecessary suffering, adding unnecessary stress to what you're experiencing. We try to bring our attention as much as we can into the present moment. So we can watch the workings of the mind, because otherwise we get into thought worlds. And the thought worlds can take us far into the past, far into the future, all around the world many times, in the blink of an eye. And we get into those thought worlds. We can't see how they're constructed. We have to be able to step out of them a little bit. Go back to the construction site. The construction site is right here, right now. We focus on the breath because it's very close to where these things are constructed. In fact, sometimes the way you breathe plays a role in how a thought forms. So try to stay here as much as you can. In the beginning, you don't want to get involved in anything else. Just stay right with the breath. Be as steady as you can, as calm as you can. And learn how to relate to the breath in a way where you can be friends. We have lots of cartoon ideas about how we breathe or how we should know the breath. For instance, when you're told to be aware of the in and out breath, part of the mind says, well, I have to have a little marker between the in-breath and the out-breath. And the marker doesn't happen on its own, so you add it. You tighten up a little bit, you tense up a little bit. And that tightness and tension prevents a sense of well-being from growing. So think of the in-breath flowing into the out-breath, the out-breath flowing into the in-breath. Like the waters of the tides, they mingle. So it's one element all the way through. And then think of the in and out-breath mingling with the other breath energies in the body. And John Lee recommends starting with a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths. He doesn't say why, but it's partly so you can be clear about the breathing, how it feels, and where it's prominent. And also because as you continue with the meditation, the breath gets more and more gentle, more and more refined, to the point where the breath energy seems to get still. 
So you want to be a full stillness. You want to oxygenate your blood first. And think of all the pores of your skin opening up so the breath can come in anywhere in the body. I have a student who has lung problems. She has to wear an oxygen monitor. And she found when she sits and meditates and consciously thinks of all the pores opening up, the oxygen level in her blood goes up. So this is one way that you can allow the mind to grow calm, allow the breath to grow calm, even at the point where it seems to stop. And you're not going to be deprived. You tap into the, the breath energy. And John Lee talks about how the breath energy spreads around the world. It's not just in your body. When it's all connected like that, then you can be very, very still. Yet the body has all of its oxygen needs are met. And learn how to stay here. Whether the breath is coming in and out or not coming in and out, you want to stay right here as long as you can. Get used to being here. Make this your default mode. This is where you keep coming back. And this is your home. It's a lot easier to work from home than it is, say, from a bus station, which is what most people's minds are like. All the doors are open. Everybody can come in and go out. All kinds of people come in and go out. All kinds of things are happening in the bus station. So it's hard to find any peace. So you close the windows, close the doors. Make this a home. Anyone's going to come in, they come in with your permission. Whoever's going to go out goes out with your permission. What do the people do when they come in? They have to have your permission as well. And you're the one in charge. And John Cha has the image of a person at home sitting in the one chair in the house. Everybody else who comes into the house has to stand. And as long as you don't get up and let somebody else take your chair, you're the one in charge. So your chair is right here with the breath. And when things get really solid like this, you feel really secure being with the breath. That's when you can allow other thoughts to come in, but allow them in the, in the sense that you're going to watch them from outside. You're not going to get into them. You're not going to travel around inside them. You're going to stay right here. And as you stay right here, you can begin to see how they're constructed. And you see the way in which you've been participating in the construction. Some of the constructions come little bits and pieces, it's like bricks and mortar and other construction of materials being sent in from the past. And there's part of the mind right here that turns them into little houses. Sometimes they're dog houses, sometimes they're human houses, sometimes they're deva palaces. But you want to realize the extent to which you play a role in the shaping of whatever is being built. And you find yourself shaping a really bad place to stay. Ask yourself, don't you have some better skills? Because people are really skilled. They can take any kind of material and they can make a decent house out of it. When I was staying with a John Furrow one time, he asked, asked me to build a shed. And he told me not to get anything new. I had to take scraps from around the monastery. And so I had to learn how to be ingenious, because some of the scraps were pretty scrappy. But I was able to put together a decent shed. In fact, it's still there. And I learned a lot, much more than if I'd been able to buy new things. So even when bad things are coming in through your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future. Remind yourself, you can make something good out of even bad things coming in. At the very least, you can gain some insight into the extent to which you've allowed your thoughts to take over, allowed yourself to travel around too much in thoughts. 
When you gain that insight, there's a sense of well-being. And from the well-being, there comes a sense of peace. The Buddha talks about two different ways you can develop equanimity. The kind of equanimity that he recommends, not just being accepting or non-reactive to whatever happens. First you have to find a sense of well-being inside, so you can satisfy the mind's needs for well-being. The two ways he recommends. One is you develop concentration, have a sense of ease with the breath, rapture with the breath, refreshment with the breath, whatever your topic is. And the other is to gain insight, to see how you've been fooled by the mind's fabrications. And you see an opening where you don't have to be fooled. And there's a great sense of joy that comes with that. You've been released. And then from the release comes the equanimity. That's one of the side effects, because after all, the release itself is something very, very pleasant. Great sense of relief. And then you can be equanimous about other things. So the equanimity has to come from a sense of well-being if it's going to be healthy. Otherwise you force yourself simply to accept, 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 and it just becomes depressing. So you work on your concentration, you work on your insight. And then we begin to see exactly where you're adding to the suffering, exactly how you're clinging, where your cravings are. This is why the Buddha began his teaching career by talking about the Four Noble Truths, because the issues always come down here. The suffering that weighs on the mind is the clinging. That's a pretty radical idea. It's caused by the craving. In other words, things are happening right here, right now. So when you see this, and you realize that you don't have to cling, then you can let go. And it's not that these things hold you down or hold you back. You're being held back by your own clinging. Well, held back by your own craving. So when you can let go, the things of the world are not going to try to run after you. You let them go, everybody goes back to their own place. So it's important that we see that there are these two types of suffering, two types of dukkha. Suffering and what's, what are called the three characteristics. Suffering that's in inconstancy. And there's a suffering that comes from craving. When you take care of the second one, the first one is not a problem. So that's where your energies can be focused. When this problem is solved, then there's nothing else to weigh down the mind.